of the Persians uh, allowed all of the exiles from different uh, nations to return. They did. It was very smart on their part. Politically, it was very smart on their part. Um, it was a little bit the reverse of like what Rome had done. When Rome took over, the whole idea of Pax Romana, the Roman peace, that they basically, they had their own people in place to, to rule, um, um, especially after, um, in certain terms of the case of Judah, uh, that um, where the Jews were um, challenging Roman authority, uh, that uh, you also had the in political infighting with, um, with, uh, with Jesus and, um, and, and the whole and the clash between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, so that uh, there was a lot going on under in terms of with Rome. Um, but um, but we, earlier on, when when after Persia defeated Babylonia, for them it was expedient. But the interesting thing was that the majority of the of the Jews didn't leave Babylonia; they stayed there. Um, and and of course that's. And it's interesting too, also to note, just as a sideline, that uh, it's not even such a sideline. It's really, it's actually significantly historically, and also in terms of um, re religiously, that the the Babylonian Talmud is the one that we re we reference as opposed to the Talmud Yerushalmi, the the Palestine, the the, the Jerusalem one, uh, and and that's I don't think that's not a, a mistake because the practices of, of in Jerusalem. And um, were were different than they were in the, in Galut, and and that is actually used as a justification. One of the justifications today that uh, if you live in Galut, you choose to live in Galut in diaspora, that you observe that some of the the 613 mitzvot of certain laws don't apply to you because they only apply to Israel. Then they came up with this legal fiction of there are 613 commandments for Jews in the Galut as well. They just kind of like, you know, they just switched them a little bit or they changed them. Um, so having said that, a lot of people is, are joining. And so I'm going to begin. Um, so just as a reminder, at our last session, many of you made me aware of the page numbers of the different editions that did not match up. And... Um, I was able to solve that with my friend Morris because um, we were we were having a conversation, and I said to him, "What edition do you have?" And he had the other edition, which was great. So we figured it out. So there's roughly 19 pages. So I will reference that even as we go along throughout the class tonight. Um, and also, I just want to react to Marty Paley. Marty, you sent me an email um, and saying that uh, you noticed that the, there was a reference to Moses having horns. That whole thing there with that is, um, <clears throat> and I too also had a personal experience that was, was like that with someone who wasn't Jewish, who had never met a Jew before. So, um, but the interpretation um, is, is um, it really, it's really like beams of light, but the Septuagint or the Septuagint, the book of 70 that was written by the, according to the legend, there were 70 scholars that were put in each in a cell and their own cells there in Alexandria, um, and they were they were given the command the order to to write the Torah, write the Bible, to literally write it, and they all wrote it the exact same way, including the translation for Karen instead of being um, a, a beam of light or something like Karen or they said instead it was like horns, and so from that point on, the, that imagery of that. Um, of the idea that, that Jews have horns, um, you know, and was played up much later on in the book of John when he said that the Jews were the devil. And of course, just the whole imagery of that. And Michael and, um, and uh, Michelangelo doing his, uh, his uh, statue of Moses um, and he has horns. So that, um, you know, because that and that would make sense because the the Latin Vulgate, which was the the Latin Bible, took it from the Septuagint, and um, and of course then later on, uh, of course, now we know that that's not true. And Marty said that when he was confronted with that, he said that uh, his was sanded down for his bar mitzvah. Um, 
So that was a, that, that was a thought that was a rather clever answer. Um, I don't know if your college roommate, you know, uh, ever appreciated it, but uh, did he laugh? Uh, I hope so. Anyways, I'm going to begin. Okay. So starting with chapter seven. So after King Josiah dies, Judah falls in 587 BCE. There's always a differential. Friedman says 587. Most historians uh, and history, history books all refer to it as 586. It's, a little, it's, it's nothing, but it's just, it's the same period. So Judah falls and the Judeans become exiles in Egypt and Babylonia. And the first edition of Deuteronomy stops making sense. The family that was supposed to have the throne of Judah forever, guaranteed by God, no longer has the throne. The temple, which was one central place for worship, was destroyed. Does the story end with the death of Josiah and ultimately the burning of the temple? If not, then how does the story continue? Friedman says, in quote, someone decided to make a second edition of it. He references the examples of JFK and I'm not gonna go into it. It's, but you can read it if you want on pages 117, 118 or 136, 137. Um, it's, it's just the whole idea of the fact is if we stop, if there's a history of the United States and we stop with JFK after he's assassinated, we know there's a history that goes beyond that. And, um, and so therefore, you know, that's why I said I didn't think that it wasn't the best example, but it's just kind of like in the sense that um, it's not necessarily the people are rewriting history, history, the events are making themselves for this, for um, with the idea of the fact that with the Deuteronomist and with the events thereafter, we need, th therefore, when he said someone decided to make a second edition of it, I think that has more, that, that to me is, is, is a little stronger. I think the JFK example was, was actually weak. But anyways, Friedman goes on, he cites several examples of being exiled throughout the text of Deuteronomy. And we're gonna read aloud the examples on page 119 and 138 if everyone has their book, so either 119 or page 138. If it's 139, please just, you'll find it. Uh, let's see, I, I got other people coming in. All right, and admit more people. Welcome everybody. Um, so if you look at, and if you look at these, um, these particular verses, you will perish quickly from the land. Yahweh will scatter you among the nations. Yahweh will drive you and your king to a nation that you have not known. You will be lifted off the land. Yahweh will scatter you among all the peoples from one end of the earth to the other. You will not lengthen days on land. I shall cut off Israel from the face of the land that I gave them. Um, this was a theme. I mean, exile is a theme throughout Deuteronomy. Um, why do you think, aside, why do you think that the exile is a, is, is, is the theme, uh, is a major theme throughout Deuteronomy? Um, is it because of what Jeremiah experienced and therefore it's included now in the rewritten history or is it something else? I'll ask the question this way. Think of the mindset of the Israelites in the desert. Where did they come from? They came, they had been, they literally were in a foreign land in Egypt. They were enslaved for a number of years. And so what they did, they exodus from, the, um, from Egypt, but in a sense, because of everything that had happened to the to Jacob's family and and the famine that had taken place, you know, during the time of Joseph, Joseph was essentially exiled out of Canaan by his brothers, sold into slavery, and ultimately the whole family comes down. And this whole idea of exile, of being in a foreign country, um, because. You didn't obey God's laws. You didn't obey God's rules. Um, you were unfaithful. 
and these kinds of themes. So exile, and I think was really placed in there at, at that particular point in Deuteronomy, because we really don't see it in other in the other books of the of the Torah. In Deuteronomy, we see it a, a lot. Okay. Um, a king. So I'm, go ahead, Shirley. Uh, but he says Yahweh will drive you and your king. That so what? Um, there's already known that there's going to be a king. Ah, okay. <laughs> good. Good. Yeah. So I mean, you, we need to. It, it's always important, and I even tell this, by the way, even in terms of of history, no matter what history it is, one needs to always understand in, in what is going on and around the the, the the time of the author is writing. I mean, that's really important with the historian because you can, there's always a, an, an idea of the fact that, that they're looking, they're, 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 used, they're projecting what is happening to them, what is going on in their time to rewrite history from an earlier time to make it more, to more meaningful. Um, trying to think of a good example. In terms of the American Revolution, using American history, um, we had several revolutionary historians uh, or historians of the American Revolution um, really start to look at the motivations of the founding fathers as to why they created the Constitution or why did they behave in a certain way? Um, what, was, what was it that this particular historian was looking at that affected his writing and he reinterpreted or she had reinterpreted the history to reflect more of what he, his political or social, social uh, position was. So we always have to be careful of that. Um, when um, John Toland wrote his, uh, his particular books about World War II and specifically um, about the attack on Pearl Harbor and, and the decisions that went into it, who knew what, when, and how he really basically, what was going on today in terms of looking back at the historical documents and basically rewriting history a little bit by basically saying that and really implying or even stating pretty closely that FDR really did know about the attack on Pearl, not specifically at Pearl Harbor, but was, knew that this was going to happen. They had, mo they had pushed the Japanese into a certain position. Tolan was one of the first to come out and really say that. Um, the very first person that did that actually was a woman by the name of Barbara Wolstetter in her doctoral thesis. And she wrote a Pearl Harbor warning or decision. And it was just, uh, you know, whether, and she's the first one that planted the idea um, of post-World War II historians looking back at it. So you always have to keep that in mind. Okay, I'll move on. Um, So Friedman, he cites several examples that we already went through those. The main reason for exile, the people violated the first commandment of the, of the, of the Bible, of the Torah. Thou shalt not have other gods before thee. King Manasseh, his sin made exile inevitable. So he, so he focuses on Manasseh as the one who's basically, he's the, he did it. After King Hezekiah um, um, was, died and passed on, the Manasseh, his sin was the fact is that he allowed idol worship in the temple and that they had idol worship in the high places. They had them in different places. And so therefore um, that, that his sin made exile inevitable. So this Deuteronomist 2, um, the author of the revised second edition adds one more curse to the list of curses found in the first edition authored by Deuteron the Deuteronomy 1. And we can find that on page 100 and 24 and, um, and actually 124 and 125. On 124 at the bottom of the page, um, where he says, and Yahweh will send you back to Egypt in the road that I had told you that you would never see again. And you will sell yourselves there to your enemies as slaves and no one will buy. Okay. So, Egypt is a place you just don't want to go back to. And it's almost like God hangs it over them as a threat, according to the second Deuteronomist. Why? 
because Jeremiah um, is the, and we identify Jeremiah as the, as the Deuteronomist, but Jeremiah is the one who gets exiled to Egypt. The first wave of exiles, exiles to, uh, from, um, from Judah were to Egypt. And, um, and Jeremiah was, was one of those. And clearly, you know, so he's putting this reference in there because that's something else you hang over the head of the people. You want to go back to Egypt? You want to go back and become slaves? You want that kind of life again? Here you have your own home. And you're not, and, and still, you, you, you know, you just like you're acting as if you're a child. You, this is it's not going to work out for you. And the second quote he has there on page 125, 144, at the top of the page, and the entire people, from the smallest to the biggest, and the officers of the soldiers arose and came to Egypt because they were afraid of the Babylonians. So there's a reference here to the political situation. Remember what I said to you, that Josiah went out and tr to, to face the Egyptian army that was coming there to help the Assyrians, and he was killed. And so, and everything changed after that. All the reforms that Josiah had, had instituted were basically kaput now, okay? All right, any questions yet so far? Okay, so the second Deuteronomy is DTR2. Every time I read DTR2, the first time I saw it, all I kept on saying was CP, you know, CPR3. I was thinking of like, you know, from, uh, from uh, Star Wars. Yes. Uh, <laughs> anyways, DTR2, he, he also inserted two chapters to the end of Second Kings, describing the unsuccessful reigns of the last four Davidic kings, their deportation along with thousands of Judeans to Egypt, the emperor's appointment of Gedaliah as governor of, Jude of Judah and his assassination, and the exiles to Egypt and Babylonia. So it's, um, everybody wants to know what is Sum Gedaliah, the fast of Gedaliah. Yeah. Uh, we, saw the, we observed that on the day after Rosh Hashanah. Um, and it's, um, so I just think it's just a, a day that they inserted as a fast day after all the eating that you did and, and everything and celebrating on Rosh Hashanah. All right. But who's Gedaliah? There are several of us who would, wouldn't mind if we got rid of some Gedalia. Uh Not that we observe it, but you know, don't even tempt us with it. You know, just let's, let's make it go away. All right. Um, Davidic access to the throne may have ended, Friedman says, but the possibility that a descendant of David, a Messiah, Mashiach, might someday rule had broad implications for Judaism and Christianity. I also just want to make aware to you the fact is that if you think, if you remember, um, when we say in the Kedusha, Al Yedei David Mashiach Tzidkecha, the house of David, the Messiah was gonna, some kind of deliverer was going to come from the house of David, um, which is a, you know, a, 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 it's an interesting concept and, and it did have tremendous implications for Judaism and Christianity um, because Jesus came from the house of David, all right, according to the, the, the genealogy according to the genealogy. Friedman identifies D, uh, D as Jeremiah in large part because the language of DTR2 and additions to Deuteronomy are essentially the same as in the book of Jeremiah. When he is exiled to Egypt in the first wave of exiles, he is accompanied by his scribe, Baruch ben Neriah, who was mentioned in the book of Jeremiah. So um, I have, um, I'm gonna share the screen with you with this particular point. And uh, I'm going to enlarge this. Excuse me. Okay. I'm just going to make it. A, I sent this to everybody, but just I want to see point this out to you, so you can see here it says in the Hebrew, "Vatenet the Sefer Hamikna, El Baruch Ben Neria, Ben Machsia, Leine Hanachmaal Dodi, Uleine Hayedim Hakatovim, the Sefer Hamikna, Leine Kol Hayudim Hayoshvim Bachatar Hamatara." and gave the deed to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of uh, Maxiah, in the presence of my kinsman, Hanamel, of the witnesses who were named in the deed and all the Judeans who were sitting in the prison compound. Baruch ben Neriah, in some respects, and, and, and Friedman showed at the, end of the chap at the end of chapter seven, that a seal actually had been found. 
and it had the name of Baruch ben Nuria. Everyone says, is he real? Is he not real? But he was real. And as a matter of fact, Friedman even um, speculates that Baruch ben Nuria may have wrote, written the, the prose of, the, um, of, of, the, of these different books, uh, post Deuteronomy, and that uh, Jeremiah actually did like more of the poetry. So that, you know, but the whole idea of the fact is this Baruch ben Nuria is real and he was a real person and he was a scribe. And so he was, he was um, gifted in the sense that he was able to, to put all of Jeremiah's thoughts together and to, re, and to record this history. All right. Okay. Any questions at this particular point, because uh, we're going to move on to the next chapter. Okay. Chapter eight, exile is the theme of this chapter. Judeans were exiled to Egypt and Babylonia, and the greatest challenge that they faced was how to preserve their religion in pagan societies. Guilt and hardships are the focus of Psalm 137, the Book of Lamentations, Ezekiel, and the last parts of Jeremiah and Isaiah. Judeans had worshiped idols, their temple was burned to the ground, and they were exiled. They yearn for return to Judah and rebuilding the temple. Some of them did, not all of them, as, as we've already stated. Um, if we look on page um, Psalm 137, pages 133, 134. Um, oh, Ahanarit Babel. Yeah. So this is the Yal Naharot Babel that, that we, we hear. And the different, and of course, the classic melody is. Al Naharot Babel Babel. Okay. Um, actually, Don McLean, by the way, he wrote another a melody for the for this text. Okay, and um, and I'm and I'm actually forgetting it right now. But it's it was actually it's kind of a neat thing the, the, what he wrote. It, it fit beautifully. It really was very lovely. Uh, you could probably Google it or or you can get it on um, on YouTube. Um, and on page 134 and 135, well, if we look, first of all, 134, uh, 133, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat, also we wept when we remembered Zion, all right? Al Naharot Babel, Sham Yashavnu Gambachinu, Bizachrenu et Zion. And then it goes on, on page 134, 135, it, the, the very famous verse, Yimesh if I forget my right, if I forget my, uh, if I forget you, Jerusalem, let my right arm forget, you know, or, or lose its cunning. Um, and that's, that which is also a very famous verse. So the Jews, this whole idea of, of guilt and, and remorse and, and, and this praying um, and even fasting, uh, all of these different factors, uh, they all came together um, in Babylonia probably a little bit in, in, in Egypt, Babylonia clearly was the center where the majority of the exiles were located. And they were also very, these were some of the best and the brightest um, that, um, again, Micha used a reference that when he described uh, Daniel, Daniel was part of that first wave to Babylonia. He was one of the brighter, the brighter guys, but Daniel didn't do anything. Daniel was kind of like, uh, hey, it is what it is, you know? Um, Whereas others like Nehemiah and Ezra were, let's let's get this. We can do this. Let's go back. Let's get to get it done again. Um, and so, and then on um, okay. So those are those are just certain examples from Psalm 137. While Judeans were in exile, Babylonia conquered Egypt, and then Persia conquered Babylonia. Persia's king Cyrus the Great allowed the Jews to return to Judah 50 years after the fall of Jerusalem. They rebuild the temple with one big difference. No cherubs, no ark, um, and there's also no tumumim. Um, and that, that they're, um, and, and so essentially, um, not having the ark and not having cherubs in the second temple indicates that they basically it may have been lost. There were some who believed that it was in, and it was in Egypt. 
and then they were in different places. There's all kinds of speculations where the where the the ark uh, was located. But as far as the cherubs are concerned, the cherubs were the ones that actually protected the ark. Remember, they were over there. They were on top of the ark, and they were, how they were facing each other, and that they were protecting it. Um, the temple is dedicated and passed over 516 BCE. And during this period, the Aaronid priests um, assume complete control of the uh, temple priestly functions. Remember the term Aaronid versus Mushite, all right? Uh, the followers of Aaron, the ones that versus the followers of Moses. Um, so we know this because the priests that were exiled in Egypt were the Mushite priests, and Jeremiah was a Mushite priest. Those priests exiled to Babylonia were Aaronid priests, and Ezekiel was an Aaronid priest. So we're really getting a sense that, so you can understand where Aaron is somehow, or the Aaronid priests, or the priests themselves, the importance of the priests are emphasized, that is where they're facing Aaron. When it's when it's when Moses is, is portrayed in a good light, it's those priests who, who are favor uh, to favor Moses. Marty, um, you, you went up a little ahead of me, but I was uh, one about the cher cherubim or the cherubim. Um, they're supposed to be winged horses, right? But uh, on arcs in many places, we see them as chill as babies with wings. They're angels, change from horses to they're babies. angels. They're angels who are shaped to have these. Well, they have different, you know, if these are. Um, ancient ancient cultures always had them, you know, their 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 gods and stuff, sounds like, or as as as, as uh, somewhat human as well as is a part animal, part human. Okay, um, it was like kind of like to give you the best of both worlds of the, of the yeah. So uh, any other questions? But that was basically it. It was that's yeah. I mean, but the significance of the cherubs is that they were there in the first temple. They're not there in the second temple. Okay. Um, all right. In 458 BCE, 80 years after the first exiles returned to Judah, Ezra arrives in Judah from Babylon with a copy of the Torah that we know today. Now, he's an Aaronid priest. He's a scribe. And he accompanies Nehemiah, which is really not true. Nehem well, he does. He comes a little bit afterward. Nehemiah came a little bit before him. He comes in Nehemiah, the designated governor of Judah, which now is a province of the Persian Empire. Ezra claims that this is the Torah of Moses. All of a sudden, this is the Torah of Moses. For all the years, we had we didn't really have an edition of it, and now we have the now we have the Torah of Moses, and that that's going to be important. Um, Ezra claims that this is the Torah of Moses. He included in this Torah our stories and references from J, from E, D, and P. How is it that Ezra has this complete Torah? Tradition refers to Ezra as Ezra HaSofer, Ezra the scribe, okay? Maybe this is a hint to the completion of the puzzle. Friedman firmly believes that four authors wrote the Bible and the last one to be identified is P of the priestly class. Now he he's always refer he refers to P every once in a while, but here he's gonna go into it, identify who he is, or on, and, and, and more information about, so we really get to get, know this particular, this four, fourth author. So moving on to chapter nine, the majority of the Torah is made up of laws related to the tabernacle, the role of the priests and sacrifices, religious life and legal matters. They comprise the last part of the book of Exodus, almost all of Leviticus and a large portion of the book of Numbers. Given that this was the complete Torah, biblical scholars Edwin Rose um, and Carl Graff placed the fourth author P in the second temple period after the return to Judah. Friedman doesn't agree with them. Friedman says, nowhere in the Pentateuch is the temple ever mentioned, but the tabernacle is, um, is never mentioned in J and D, only three times in E but over 200 times in P. So this is also important because these other authors don't make reference to the, to the temple at all. Um, but J, D, and E, it's not important because it didn't exist. 
didn't exist, but the tabernacle is mentioned over 200 times by P. Biblical scholars such as Graf and others claim that the tabernacle was in fact, they called it a pious fraud, that it was basically a, a substitute for the, for, the, for the temple, which had existed. And that's what they were trying to basically justify the fact that P was, a, was writing in the second temple period and that he created the tabernacle as a legal fiction, as it were. Friedman points out several mistakes made by Graf and others. The first mistake was that Rose claimed that the prophets never quote P and therefore P was later than the prophets during the second temple period. The second mistake was labeling the tabernacle as a fiction, as a symbol of the second temple. Julius Wellhausen, who really was the preeminent biblical scholar um, in his day, and after all these other, after the previous ones, builds on graphs and other scholars' theses that P wrote in the second period, with the idea that religion was centralized and was assumed as part of daily religious life. Friedman says this was the third mistake. So let's turn to page 147 in the book, in the, uh, and 147, 148, or 166, 167. Um, down at the bottom of the page, it says, the Wellhausen's picture was very attractive. It placed a priestly source in a priestly period. It identified guilt sacrifices and holidays of atonement in a period of guilt and atonement. It placed Ezekiel in ideas in the period that came right after Ezekiel. It explained the, con the concentration of the tabernacle in P terms of the period of concentration on the temple. It was logical, coherent, persuasive, and Friedman says it's wrong. <laughs> okay. Right. And um, he says the prophets did know about P and that Jeremiah was hostile toward P. Well, that would make sense. P is an Aaronid priest, most likely. I mean, he is. And Jeremiah is a Mushite priest. So this is the Moses versus Aaron. This is like trying to basically justify the existence, um, not just the existence, but the importance of, of your team. Let's, let's put mm -hmm. it this way, all right? That's basically what it's coming down to, all right? Um, the prophet Ezekiel also knows P because he refers to him when indicting the people for not following God's laws. Um, page 150, all right, the next page, 150, 169, or 169. And basically, yeah. um, if someone wants to, if someone wants to read this, these different, these, these different verses at the top of page 150 or 169, Beginning, yeah, says, those yeah. are the words of the covenant, the words of the indictment in Ezekiel's covenant lawsuit. Would someone oh. like to read it? No, it's terrible. Would someone like to read it out loud? Go ahead, Marcy. Okay, you did not walk according to my statutes, and you did not do my, you did not do my judgments. The P covenant curse says you will eat the flesh of your sons. Ezekiel's covenant lawsuit includes the judgment, fathers will eat sons in your midst. The P covenant curses say, and I shall send the wild beast among you and it will bereave you. And I shall bring the sword over you and I shall send pestilence in your midst. Ezekiel's covenant lawsuit includes the, the judgment and I shall send hunger and evil beast over you and they will bereave you and pestilence and blood will pass through you and I shall bring the sword over you. I feel like I'm reading the Haggadah. <laughs> well, you know, that's, you know, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, but just this whole idea of the, the language, that's why you need to look at the language and you don't have to be a Hebrew scholar, especially when Friedman translates it for you into the English. And so you get a sense of it. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you were a Hebrew scholar and you were looking at a biblical scholar, specifically in biblical Hebrew, you would really have a great sense of this, the, the syntax, the grammar, the style, um, 
and the wording. It's, it, it's just, it, it's, it's not a coincidence. You, it's clear that, the, that, that, uh, that Ezekiel was familiar with P. P was writing this stuff, Ezekiel was quoting it later on. And so it, it, it made sense, okay? Um, Ezekiel gives instructions to build a temple. P gives details on the tabernacle. Friedman cites works by Professor Avi Hurwitz of Hebrew University that P was earlier than Ezekiel because the Hebrew used in um, used is, an, er, is in an earlier form and places P before the Babylonian exile. You, when you make this your life's work and you really in, and you enjoy it and you invest in it, it's fascinating just to see basically how he really brings it, he brings it apart. He tears it apart. He's breaking it down, and he's and he's and he's really taking a good hard look at this. The language, the similarities here, the similarities there. Yes, there are contradictions. Why are there contradictions? The contradictions are is because they're trying to fit both traditions, the Aaronid and the Mushite versions, and other stories, the J version, the E story, the G E version, the D version, all of these different versions, and trying to make them fit. And so in some places, it just doesn't fit, it doesn't make sense. And people, even when, uh, uh, when, you, when you read the Torah every, every Shabbat and you, you come across something that says, well, why are we repeating this? Or this seems a little bit of a contradiction. Well, now you have a little better understanding of why, okay? Um, the one area in which Friedman accepts Bellhausen's thesis is the tabernacle. Friedman shows that why Graf and Wellhausen were wrong to show a direct uh, scaling of the temple. This is fascinating. All right, this chapter here on the on the temp on the the temple and the tent uh, the tabernacle that previous ones, including Wellhausen, all tried to place the tabernacle into the tent, uh, the the tabernacle into the temple, and that that it was a direct proportion too. I'm not going to get into all of the different figures and everything like that. Um, by the way, just as a show of hands. How many of you really enjoyed that chapter? <laughs> a few people. There were some people I'm looking at that I figured would really like it because it's kind of like a lot of mathematics and it's a lot of, I think it's a lot of putzking around there and it's okay, it's, it's great. Um, and the first time I read it, I said, oh, this is neat. And then you go on to read it and Friedman says it's not at all. It's just- This is the one with the cubits. Yeah. Well, there's always cubits. What are they? They didn't have. No, the whole it. chapter was on cubits. I love this chapter. Yes. Of okay. course you would. You're a mathematics person. Well, therefore you would have liked. That's why my I was thinking of it. So, Mila, you would also would have loved the Noah story, right? Yep. Yeah. Two okay. by two. A lot of cubits. All right. Yeah. Well, I love those cubits <laughs> okay. to be deter. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, it basically through a whole series of mathematical and uh, architectural configurations. Friedman indicates that the tabernacle was smaller than the first temple and actually fit inside the Holy of Holies beneath the wings of the cherubs, not the exact proportion as Wellhausen and Graf and others had cited that it fit into the, you know, proportionally into the temple, but into the Holy of Holies, mm. which is a smaller, it was a smaller section, all right? Um, And it was beneath the wings of the cherub. And he gives it that, that diagram that shows you that um, on page, page 162 or 181, whichever you have your edition. And you can see, you know, basically how that fits there. Um, I, th I just thought it was fascinating. I never thought of it. Uh, oh, oh wow. You know, it, when you really see it, then when you see the, the picture there, um, that the, that drawing, that it really does, oh, this actually kind of really makes sense. Citing different biblical sources referencing the tabernacle, Friedman thus deduces that P, excuse me, was an Aaronid priest writing during the first temple period, and that the stories of P closely parallel the stories of J and E. Any questions up to this point? I didn't want to hey. dwell a lot on this chapter, even though it's a fascinating chapter, because it's so, it's just grounded in minutia. Okay. Um, Steve. Yes, Sue. Can I ask you, through all of this, the thing that keeps bothering me is that 
you know, we get all of this focus on the Ark and on the Tabernacle and then Second Temple, nobody references it at all. It, there's no story of where it went. There's no story of destruction. There's no story of loss. There's no story of the impact on the Jewish people. It's just, it was there. It was taken to Babylonia maybe, and it's not there and we never reference it again. Oh, it was so, so this is, I find this very odd. As a matter of fact, um, I mean, you're right. And there's, there is no reference to it there. And it's a matter, and we, and we know that certainly for a fact, because even after the destruction of the second temple, anything of value was taken back to Rome. And we yep. know that it was documented because they have, you know, they have, um, um, everything, all kinds of, they have drawings and they have all kinds of records of it. And even on the, on the gate, uh, the Arch of Titus is that you have the certain things from the, from that destruction that they brought back, the booty that they brought back from Jerusalem after the destruction of the second temple. We, yeah, we don't know. We just don't know where it is. I know, I think that, uh, Indiana Jones really tried to make a good stab at it. Um, but, uh, that was that was that was great fantasy. It was great writing. It was a wonderful movie, but hey, um, yeah, we just made. Who knows? Maybe someday someone may discover it. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's. Um, I mean, when you think about the size of it, and that they had to schlep this thing, they had to break it down. Then they had to schlep it, put it back up, because they were moving. You know, I mean, they were stationed in the desert for in a lot of, in one place for many, many for a long period of time. So, but when they had to move, they had to break it down, and they had to bring it into Israel, into Canaan. They had to bring it into Israel, and they had to set it up again. Okay, and according to that, it was actually probably set up in the north. At first, it wasn't set up in, in down in the south because the capital didn't become uh, Jerusalem didn't become the capital until David moved it there from Hebron. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. <laughs> sure. Um, what became, what happened with the Mushite um, Kohanim in the second temple period? Did they still identify as priests? Um, they did. I mean, they were the Shilonite priests. The Shilonite priests, they're the ones, they came from, the, from, Shil from Shiloh. And after the Assyrian um, the destruction by Assyria of the north, the ten tribes, they got dispersed everywhere. And many of them came south with their stuff, with their traditions. And supposedly they had the ark and they brought that to the south. And then the Aaronid priests who were down there, all of a sudden now there was this, they got along and they tried to integrate them and make them feel comfortable and inclusive and everything. But they had, uh, but the, but P really felt like, oh no, they're not going to steal our thunder, All right? It was also, you have, you have to understand, according to tradition, the one tradition is that, um, that uh, Moses, oh, I'm sorry, there's one, oh, admit, I, I, I apologize, okay. There was one, uh, one tradition has it that when God was, talking to Moses at the at the bush and, and, and basically saying, I want you to go and I want you to, you're going to be my agent. And he said, but I'm slow of tongue. All right. We didn't know why he said that because up in the red, they came up with the Midrash about that with the, you know, the coal and the gold when he was a little baby in the Pharaoh's court. Um, that because Moses was the one that was going to get become the, the high priest, the Kohen Gadol. And because he really argued with God, and just, you know, kept on saying, I just don't want to go. I can't do this. I can't do this. Aaron will be your spokesperson then. Okay. And that's where Aaron in comes in. See, Aaron's a hero here because Aaron now becomes a spokesperson for Moses because Moses is slow of speech. Think about this. There's no reference where all of a sudden is this idea of slow of speech. So therefore that, again, there's another, I didn't even think about this until I just said it. So it's probably another instance of where the, in order to make Aaron stand out more than Moses, this is this is what they do. So the whatever priests were up there in the from the north, they went south, and um, 
but they were still adherence to to Moses then and that's why they really wanted to make sure and emphasize that Moses really was significant Moses was the one that brought them out of Egypt I mean it was God but it was Moses with the agent Moses was a shepherd he physically brought them out of Egypt he physically endured their hucking and their and they're driving him crazy all right um and and you know when he has to go and he and he takes counsel with uh with Yitro and he says, like, I, these people are driving me crazy. And Yitro says, well, you're trying to make, you're trying to decide every case that comes before you, make a decision, and you shouldn't. You should be able to, you should divide it. You should apportion yourself. Um, but Moses is the hero. And then on the other hand, Aaron has to be, has to look good. So this whole idea of bringing them all together, I think that that's, um, I don't know how else to answer that question. Essentially, it's really that, uh, that they were, they were there. They they created their own identity. They they try to stand their turf and and make their argument as much as they possibly could. Yeah, Shirley. The reason I'm asking is that um, people today who are Kohanim, uh, at first they said that there was a uh, DNA of uh, descendants of Aaron. But it's been discovered since then that there is more than one. They come from uh, mainly from two ancestral groups. There is what they call the Kohen modal haplotype, which is large, about 52% of Kohenem today. But there is another group that's equally as old uh, that has 7%. And they are all. Kohanim, and uh, but they have their two different uh, common ancestral groups, and uh, so I was wondering whether the Mushites continued to identify as Kohanim, and that would explain the differences in the DNA. Um, and they were not brothers to begin with. I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. I, I appreciate you bringing that up. I was not aware of that specific, di you know, that difference there like that. So thank you. Now I have some homework to do. Okay. <laughs> so, um, which is great. Uh, I'm always looking for, for, to, to, you know, for challenges like I'm that. I'm just trying to explain. <laughs> well, that's that okay. If you could do me a favor, if you could email me what you said to me. All right. Yes. Cause I, not, I couldn't take it, trying to take it all in. Okay. And that would be really great. And I will, maybe I'll have an answer for you for next week. Okay. How's that? Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Um, so Friedman deduces that P was an Aaronid priest writing during the first temple period and that the stories of P closely parallel the stories of J and E. So therefore, it's from a specific time pre-first temple. Okay. And pre-Babylonian exile. All right. In order to properly identify P, we return to the period immediately following the fall of Northern Kingdom. So in chapter 11, Friedman brings us back a little bit uh, in order to put it a little more in, in some context there. Um, the Northern Kingdom of Israel in 722 BCE. Many refugees um, enter Judah and arrive in Jerusalem, just like I said before. And since they share many similarities related to culture, history, and especially religion, they are welcomed by the Judeans. One area in which they differ is who are the official priests. Okay, so this is, you know, a little bit on that line. The Shilohite priests, they trace their ancestry back to Moses and rely heavily on the E version of their Torah, and in which God speaks to Moses and Aaron as a Levite, but not necessarily Aaron's brother. This conflicts with the J version known in Judah for, and for the sake of Shalom Bayat, the two versions are combined and are known in P's version, Aaron is Moses' older brother and God speaks to both Aaron and Moses together. P also claims that the sacrifices, they begin when God appoints Aaron the high priest, while in J and E, sacrifices are common in the book of Genesis. The first sacrifice, In the story of Cain and Abel, okay, and that um, 
you know, that Cain complains to God that you don't like my sacrifices. You like Abel's better. You take his better. And God says, because he picked the first of the, 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 the best of the, of the flock. Um, and I mean, that's again, it's, it's, it's the whole idea of the fact is that sacrifices did exist. Noah makes a sacrifice when after, after the, uh, the land, the, the, the seas, they dry and everything becomes dry and the ark rests and he lets everybody out. And the first thing he does is to make a sacrifice to, to an appreciation. The fact is that they all survive. And sacrifices were, were, were personal sacrifices were part of, a, of were part of the culture of the whole area, so it wasn't so. It shouldn't be surprising that it would be just before, uh, you know, that it wouldn't be in an earlier period. Um, Friedman cites the two flood stories as an example of how the two confusingly combined versions, uh, J, E, and P, can be separated. In the JE versions, clean animals are brought into the ark, are to be used for sacrifices once the food, the flood has subsided. The key here is clean animals. The reference clearly is that they have to be kosher, that they have to be a certain kind of animal. They have to be herbivores, some kind of that they're, that they're really, that they can't be, um, that they're not carnivores. That would be the implication, a clean animal, something that could be used for sacrifice. But for a code in, in, in terms of understanding the laws of Kashrut. And if that were the case, then that's post Sinai. And so they would, but they would still understand that. Um, in P, no sacrifices are mentioned until Aaron becomes the high priest. Therefore, just male and female of every species is brought on board. Friedman states that the priests are the only intermediaries between humans and God, and therefore, the only ones in charge of sacrifices. He cites other examples to demonstrate the contradictions between the JE and the P versions. And if we were to um, look on page one, one seventy one. 190. And down at the bottom of the page here, uh, he says that um, in the day that Yahweh God made earth and heavens, while the P creation story begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right. So he's just using that, 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 that whole issue of the, of the creation, uh, that God made earth and heavens, earth, earth and the heavens, while P creation says the beginning, God's creating the heavens and the earth. So that, um, again, slightly different, but they had to make a compromise and both versions are in there. That's why they're there, both there, they repeat. Friedman furthers his hypothesis that P had to solidify his position by citing the story of Korach's rebellion in Numbers uh, 16. And now we find that on pages 172, 175, or 191 through 194. Um, would someone, would someone like to read this out loud? Maybe like a couple of people, um, the bottom of page 172 or 191, where it says the rebellion number 16. So if someone would, um, would someone like to read, please, please? <laughs> Marty, you like to read. <laughs> All right, I'll read. Um, I'm at page 191. Where where do you want me to start? In Korach, son of Yisar. On 191? 193, I think. Is it's bold. In your book? Well, I in guess. bold print. Kind of yeah, okay, 193. got it. Uh, it's 193. I got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and Korach, son of uh, Izar, son of uh, Kohat, son of Levi, and Datan and Abiram, son of Eliab, and On, son of Pelet, son of Reuben. Before Moses, and 250 people from the children of Israel, princes of the congregation, known in assembly, people of stature. Okay. So. 
What I want to do now, you saw that you, in these two things, you see the bold print is, yep. the, is the Priestley and the J text is in regular type. Now, if you were to do this, just read. Um, I want one person to read just the, the J text and another person read from here on in the Priestley text in the bold. So you're gonna you're gonna take turns. So you need to follow, okay? Um, Who would like to do that? I'll do one of them, but which one? I'll do another if no one volunteers. Although Judith raised her hand, so that's good. All right. So oh, Judith, good. Judith, good. why don't you do do the J text in the regular print? All right, and Marty, you do the bold print. You want me to start? Well, you're the, you're the bold print. All right. And Korok, son of, you, you want to go back to the beginning? No, verse three. Okay. Assemble against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, you have a great deal for all of the congregation. Yeah. You said just read the bold. That's yeah. still bold. That's all bold. It is? Oh, yeah. Okay. All of them are holy, and Yahweh is in their midst. And why do you lift yourself up over Yahweh's community? And he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korach and to all of this congregation, saying, In the morning, Yahweh will make known who is uh, his and who is holy, and whom he will bring close to him. Okay, so him. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want you to get a sense of this. So, Judith, if you'll go down to verse 12... Because that's where it finally it picks up now with the J text. And Moses sent to call Datan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and they said, we will not come up. Is it a small thing that you brought us up from a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you lorded over us as well? Besides, you have not brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey or given, given us possession of field or vineyard. Will you put out those people's eyes? We will not come up. And Moses was very angry, and he said to Yahweh, Do not incline to their offering. Not one ass of theirs have I taken away, and I have not wronged one of them. Okay. So you could just see this just juxtaposition of these two stories, these two traditions, how they're brought together. All right. Um, so that and that's why, he, so he really does solidify his hypothesis that P had to solidify his position by citing the story of Korok's rebellion. Uh, also the differing concepts of God, which we find on page 176. And now I said 195, but I have no idea now again. Um, so it might be 198, 197. Um, the 13 attributes of God, as we know, Adonai, Adonai, El Rachun, Bechanun, Nerachapayim, Barav Chesed, Be'emet. Okay. Noser Chesed, Alafim. Merciful and gracious, long forbearing and full of faith, storing, uh, storing faithfulness for thousands, bearing transgression and, off and offense and sin. Um, so this whole idea of the concept of God, it's it's rather anthropomorphic in a sense, really, when you think about it, that's, it's attributing a human characteristics to, to God. Merciful, gracious, long forbearing, full of faithfulness and truth, storing faithfulness for thousands, bearing transgression and offense and sin. These are human, we do, this is what people do, all right? Um, and, and of course it, it also, that was, that's another technique that basically made God a little more palatable, let's say, because they, the anthropomorphic uh, a, a characterization of God, um, and actually, like when God passes before Moses and he sees the back of his head, he doesn't see his face, but he sees the back mm -hmm. of his head. Um, I mean, you, just these all of these little these little references here. Um, <laughs> diminishing Moses' role and elevating Aaron's role in the water from the rock versions. That's the other one. In the first version, we know about the first story of the the water. God tells Moses to hit the rock and water will come gushing forth. In the second story, dealing with, with again, the same thing, 
um, God tells Moses to speak to the rock. Moses is just frustrated. He hits the rock. And this is actually the incident that ultimately basically, you know, God says, you disobeyed me. And you're going to have to be a scapegoat in a sense. Or you're not, I shouldn't say a scapegoat. You're going to have to be, you're, you people have to see that even you can't violate my laws or, or commandment or, or an order that I give. And so therefore you shall not enter the land. You will, you will die before that. Mm. You'll see it, but you won't go into it. Um, and so again, that story, the whole idea of the fact is who comes out looking better in which version? Moses comes out looking really good in the first version and Aaron comes out looking good in the second version, okay? What is also important is not just the combining of different versions, but what parts of JE version P left out to strengthen his position. Um, again, on page 184, Friedman cites, and I say 184 with 203, is it maybe like 206 or 205 where it says the additions and subtractions? Mm -hmm. Okay. In that first paragraph of additions and subtractions, he says, we learn about the writer of P not only from the way he retold old stories, but also from looking at what he minimalized or left out altogether. Notably, he cut the stories of Genesis down to a critical minimum. Stories that take pages or even chapters in JE come out as verses in P. The story of Joseph, for example, is about 10 chapters long in JE, but just a few sentences in P. Um, so that's just, uh, again, and, and, and therefore, so what is, what is most notable in P is that, and what, no, what's, excuse me, what's most notable is that P adds quite a bit of law, half of Exodus, half of Numbers, or a little more than half of Numbers, and basically all of Leviticus. And um, on page 186, um, at the very end there, the point of this is that we can see in P, just as in J, E, and D, the relationship between the biblical text and the events of the author's world. Every biblical story reflects something that mattered to its author. And that's what I was saying earlier. Whenever we figure, the, figure out what it was and why it mattered, we move a step closer to knowing who wrote part of the Bible. And when we can assemble the, piece, the, play, the pieces and see how they connect to one another, we move closer still. Now we have enough evidence from P to locate its author in the biblical world. And so that is it for this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, oh. I would like any questions, any comments, mm -hmm. anything that you, you want clarifying or anything like that, I'll try. Steve. 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 Yes. Okay, but uh, I mean, it said in uh, in Friedman's book that uh, that both J and E and P talk about the Garden of Eden and the story of uh, Noah and the flood. Yep. That's true, right? You know, I saw a documentary a few years ago, and there was a couple of scholars, and they said that. Uh, that obviously that that uh, up until the time that they went to exile in Babylon, they didn't know about the, they, there was no they didn't know anything about the flood or creation, and that that had to come from the Babylonians. So that was, so it had well, to be that would have been that's not such a well, that's kind of an interesting concept. All right, that's um, yeah. well, well, but basically every culture. In, in ancient Middle East culture, had a flood story. You have really? Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh. Well, that's All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, and um, I mean, it, now you—it's a great point that you bring up, Bob. Um, I'm not. I don't. I don't know about that so much. Um, <laughs> but. but All I can say to you is this, mm -hmm. that 
there is you know, every day new archaeological evidence yeah, right. keeps on coming up and it seems to say oh it makes another reference to another character or to an event or a particular something that happened in the torah in the in the chumash in the in the the, 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 the pentateuch or in the tanakh that reinforces it, like the same thing with this Baruch Ben Neriyah, that this this, right. this this seal that they found. Um, they just came up with, I uh, just read recently that they discovered, oh, I'm trying to remember now. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just, I just, I, I happen to catch it. It was a small reference. Some archaeologists, they uh, uh, find that uh, basically during the uh, uh, Maccabean period, um, that that which is like 160, 165, 168, 165 period BCE, um, there's, they found certain uh, references to that and etchings that they that they discovered. Um, there have been a stone etching. As a matter of fact, one second, let me see if, oh, I don't think I have it on, I don't think I have it here. I'm gonna share the screen, but I don't think. Um, that's not the one I want. I apologize, one second. I gotta get rid of that. Um, yeah, all right, I know what I gotta do, okay. I don't think I have it here. I don't. All right, but I'm just gonna. I just want to get rid of this. Okay, that's good. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing. All right. Um, I can't find it in what I'm gonna look. Well, I'll, I'll think if I can find it for next week. Um, but um, you know, there's archaeological evidence all the time that just new archaeological digs and findings. That really show us that you know what this history is it's it's there it's real so i not and and and, and they certainly had an oral tradition people have an oral tradition mm -hmm. especially if they didn't didn't write these things down or didn't have the, the the wherewithal to do it um like the materials or anything like that they had an oral tradition which was unbelievable i mean we certainly know that african cultures have these south american cultures native american cultures in south america have in central america that's something that we these are recounting the stories of our of our heritage of our ancestry, yeah. which is crucial because yeah. everybody asks the question, where, where do we come from? Yeah. You know, but it says it says in the first chapter in Daniel that when he went into the royal court, they taught him the language and the writings of the Chaldeans. So obviously, so he didn't know anything about the, the, the culture of the, of the Babylonians until he went there. And he was a scribe. True, you're right. He may not have really known specifically, but right. it didn't mean he didn't know about it. They had already had they Judah and, and Babylonia did have a political relationship. Remember when Josiah was right. killed, right. he was killed by the Egyptians because he went out to challenge them because right. because Judah was a was was really a, 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 an ally of Babylonia. Right. Well, they really depended upon Babylonia for their protection as well. Right. Okay. okay, so I mean, it's it's not oh, as if he yeah. wasn't aware of it. Right. Okay. okay, I like uh, to address it as well. Yeah, surely. Um, the Hebrews originated in the northern fertile breast, uh, crescent area, right. um, and maybe they brought those similar stories with them. Okay. Uh, when they uh, when they went to the uh, Mediterranean area, um, <laughs> and they had similar stories in Babylon, uh, uh, and but maybe they had a common earlier uh, origin. These are all valid thoughts on your, on your, on yeah. your, your part, Bob's part. I mean, because I've also heard um, in many places that um, uh, that the stories came from the exile in Babylon, mm -hmm. the Genesis stories. But it is also possible that there was a more distant common uh, 
origin of those stories? The lang these are all wonderful points. And of course, Ezra does come from Bab I mean, it was Babylonia. It was, it was, it was, it was taken, it was defeated by Persia, right, right. but it was still, this land itself was Babylonia. The culture was still Babylonia. Right, right. So that, so that you're, in some respects, it's, I mean, it's fascinating just to even listen to you when you bring this up that only, so kind of, and what Bob says, so it's kind of like, well, you know what? That's where he, he brings this Torah back. How come he brings the Torah then? How come is this complete Torahs now when, when Ezra comes back to Jerusalem? All right. After the Jews are in are in Babylonia since 586, and and he's coming back 458. So that it's really that's a there's an that's a hundred and thirty odd years. Okay, so I think that's um that's I like that I that's kind of that's kind of neat I like that kind of thinking um, certainly. Um, doesn't really challenge what I'm saying. As a matter of fact, if anything, it might have kind of like actually makes some sense now. With the one exception, the stories themselves, the language, the only thing I would say is that <clears throat> why wouldn't the Torah have been written more in, um, let's say, pro-Babylonian, or I shouldn't say pro-Babylonian, <laughs> in terms of language that, like Ezekiel was in Babylonia. Yeah. So why wouldn't it be written more on the Aaronit or the P Basically, all P. Why do we get J? Why do we get E? And why do we get D? D. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. So there really is um, one author I could understand who wants to make all this stuff up or take all of these different traditions and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you can really do clearly do have four different authors or four different characters, um, perceptions, or accounts. And they and sometimes they're similar and sometimes they're not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is great. I to thank you very much for this. This is wonderful. Anybody else? Howard, you're back. Uh -huh. <laughs> um so anyway, I just want to um thank everybody. Thank you. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. We will meet next week. So we will definitely conclude on time. That's for sure, which is nice. Um, and I just want to everyone have a good week. So we're gonna complete, we're gonna we're gonna conclude the book. So chapters 12, 13, 14. The new edition has an epilogue, the old one does not. So maybe I'll 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 just talk about the epilogue as postscript, but we'll we're gonna focus on um, on basically who was the person who really put all of this together, okay? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Thanks. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful, a wonderful night. The evening is basically done. Hi. Yes, Howard? Thank you. Oh, okay. Anybody, question? Are you muted, do you, you, Howard? No, I'm fine, thank you, Steve. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, I gotta stop the recording. Laila Tov. Laila Tov.